Welcome to the Empower You podcast. Our goal is to empower you to change the world. For more content like this, go online to empoweru.live. That's empoweru.live. Welcome to the podcast of Empower You. We're so fired up to have uh, Leo Goaz with us today, and he's become a really good friend. Um, as many of you know, I'm a pastor here in Colorado Springs called The Road at Chapel Hills, and uh, Leo is one of our elders here at The Road. He is also part of the men's ministry, which has really blossomed and taken off um, as as kind of one of the key leaders of that. We have this this breakfast that we do on Tuesday mornings called Wholehearted Men, and we have about 400 men that come to that. And Leo's been a table leader, a key leader of that. But Leo's interesting in that he played seven years in the NFL from 1990 to 1997. He played on three NFL teams, and he's pretty humble about it. I don't know that I knew that about Leo. Leo, I don't know if I knew that about you for like the first four or five times that I met you. I just thought you were really, really big. Um, and, and really massive. Um, as many of you know, I was a gymnast in college and high school. Um, so I'm not massive and I'm not big. Um, but I met Leo and he's from Hawaii and he kind of has that look about him. Like if you're in a dark alley and it's a, it's a full moon night, uh, you might avoid that if you saw him walking through the alley. Now, what's interesting is that Kathy, his wife, is this diminutive little thing. Um, so they're, 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 what is she, like 5'2"? No, she's about 5'5". Five, five. She's 5'5"? Five, five? Well, don't let that kid you. Oh, man, I would have never <laughs> thought that. I, I mean, when she's next to this guy, what are you, 6'3 or 6'4"? Six, 6'4". Four? Six, four. Six, four, and when you, what was your playing weight? I played at about 315. Man. Now, you're less than that now. What are you, like 285 now? Uh, I'm trying to get back down there. <laughs> okay. Are but you over, are you over 300 three, right now? I'm around 300, yeah. So he was at my fire pit last night at our house for a party. And he, one thing, like when I, when I walk into a situation, I'm always looking for the food, okay? That's what I think about. I think when you walk into a situation, you look at the caliber of the chairs. <laughs> <laughs> Because yes. he, cause he yes. came over to the fire pit and you, he's just standing there. And I'm thinking, okay, he's looking at my plastic Adirondack chairs and wonder <laughs> if he's going to crush them. So mm-hmm. anyway, he's got an interesting perspective. But anyway, I wanted to have Leo on because he has such a unique and powerful story of being a believer in Christ in the NFL. And I'm going to let him tell the story more than me. But um, why don't we begin with... Uh, your life in Hawaii, uh, where you're born and raised, your dad being a police officer. I mean, just everything's super interesting to me. I just find it all captivating. So take us back. You start playing football a little bit as a kid. You're not even that good. Um, and then kind of how that evolution occurred. And, and I think it's cool to talk about your relationship with your father, too. Anything you mm-hmm. want to share on that, Leo? All right. So I'm a baby of eight kids. Five boys, three girls. I was the last. Uh, four older brothers who all excelled in youth sports, uh, baseball, basketball, and football from a young age. And then went on to play uh, high school and college. The last two above me played college at the University of Hawaii. So there was a lot of kind of expectation put on me as a young boy to follow suit. Uh, but... I was a real kind of a laid back, had no interest in really in sports. Uh, It wasn't, I kind of grew into it uh, just as I got older and and the influence of my dad um, had a lot lot to do with it. But I struggled uh, athletically early on. Like you said, I, I started playing football at the age of 12, Pop Warner. And if I were to show you a picture of, the 12 year old me, you would not say that guy is going to be an NFL player. But through, I would say, just a lot of patience from my dad and encouragement through the years and some key men that came across my path while I was trying to or developing as an athlete that made huge, a huge impact 
uh, in that in that effect to that effect. It wasn't pretty in the beginning, but as I grew older, um, it just everything kind of flipped on its on its head to where the guys that were dominating me as a 12, 13 year old, I was literally crushing as a sophomore, junior and senior in high school. I grew six inches from sixth grade to eighth grade. So when I showed up as a freshman, I was already about six, three, about 200 and 215 pounds as a tight end. So uh, getting back to my dad, though, he was clearly the 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 one person and all my brothers would say the same he was just a uh, an incredible dedicated all in 100% father even when i was struggling he saw something in me that i didn't even see in myself um and he nurtured that through the years i could remember as a young boy watching sunday football that would be probably in the late 70s and he would tell me that's going to be you one day and I was like, okay. <laughs> um, and, and he kept doing that throughout, throughout the years, just instilling that in me. That was really his dream for himself, to have one of his five boys play in the NFL. That was clearly his dream for, for himself. Went into high school, and things uh, from an athletic standpoint really changed from prior to that. Uh, I got... Um, a lot stronger, um, my skills began to develop. I think to, to sum it up, my brain and my body kind of was sinking together to where um, signs of athleticism were, were starting to show. And I just, at that point, wanted to make my dad happy. And so I worked my tail off. I, would, I was a workout maniac. I met a, met, a, met a gentleman who had a gym not far from where we we lived on Oahu, and that one individual um, instilled a lot of confidence in me through weights, through strength training, and through development in my body to where, um, uh, and I bought into it 100%. And so when I showed up at in high school, at the private school that I, I got into, I was stronger than all the offensive linemen, and I was only a tight end. I was just really strong just from working out so hard and uh, for those couple of years with this gentleman. And um, um, yeah, high school was a great experience, although, um, you know, there were other parts in my life that were a mess. Athletics was, was something that everybody began to know or associate me with, was my ability to, to um, do well at football and to play and do really well at basketball. I was a basketball player as well. As far as athlete, athletically over on, it was a process much in um, kind of instilled by my dad and nurtured by my dad. My brothers would always kid early on that they, they had they had big doubts about me early on. <laughs> and um, so when I finally, you know, got into college and, and beyond, um, we, we still laugh about that till today. And I'm in my mid fifties, so it's um, it, it was a it, it, the athletic part was a was definitely um, a, a thing of just persistence and dr uh, having an internal drive to 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 want to um, uh, do very well. Now you said your older brothers uh, played. Everybody was very athletic. Sounds like the family was there a. Was there a teasing, a kidding uh, that, that went on as, as kind of the caboose, sort of the last one that maybe even spurred you on some? Not really directly to my, to my face, but I could hear it amongst, you know, chatter amongst the older, my old, older two brothers right above me. And, and uh, what's, the, what's the age span? So the one, the, the middle brother is seven years older than me. Uh, he's the one I'm really close with. And then the one... Below him is five years older than me. Then we have a sister in between that brother and me. Um, so there was nothing like hazing at home because my dad wouldn't have tolerated it. But they, so the, the middle brother was the best man at my wedding. And he even shared that at, 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 with his speech at my wedding that they all had their doubts about me. 
<laughs> and I was at that time when I got married, I was in college already about to, you know, look like I was going to go to the NFL mm-hmm. or had a chance to. And um, so that's something that even, yeah, they, they still get, get around with. But I think it was just a matter of me, you know, I'm the tallest. The, everyone in my family's the brothers are like 6'1", six, 6'2". Six, and then I was, um, uh, you know, 6'4". And so my dad actually wanted 10 kids. But my, my mom said, nope, that's it. You got eight. It'd be, you shut it down <laughs> at eight. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, athletically, um, it, it was a huge thing in, in, our, in our family. My dad was just, um, he was at every practice. He came L- to the practices. Liter- to, literally he came every to, uh, practice. All, all, the, all the brothers or just you? Everybody. How did he do that with his job? So he was a sergeant. You know, so he just made, found a way to, at some point he was going to show up. Uh, I mean, I was a dedicated dad to all my kids, baseball yeah. and ballet and all the stuff that they did, but I didn't go to the practices. Yeah. Wow. He was pretty much at every practice and, um, he, he just had this, um, way of, I mean, he, he was a pretty reserved guy. He didn't really say much, but when he did there was volumes behind what he said. And um, he set a really high bar for us hmm. and he didn't lower it. And we would hear about it if, if we were in his mind slacking or just not giving effort. Effort on the football field for him was everything. You just played to the whistle. And uh, that was something that was just ingrained in me. And I think really something that late, years later the NFL scouts saw that really had me just jump off the film hmm. and when they watched me play because I literally would play to the to the whistle and some some of the highlights that they show today back in Hawaii is is a, my senior year me escorting on a screenplay running like 80 yards leading out running the running back into the end zone against BYU that's a that's a a reoccurring uh, film clip that they always show when it comes to University of Hawaii sports, is that one clip. Hmm. And, um, but it was just a part of me. It was just something that uh, I didn't even have to think about. Mm-hmm. It, I just something that I just did. Yeah. So let's talk about Kathy a little bit and that how you guys met. And then she was sort of part of your spiritual journey. Very much so. So, so we, we met going into our senior year in high school the summer going into our senior year. She was a cheerleader for my our rival school, uh, all boys Catholic school. She so she was at an all girls Catholic school, cheered for this all boys Catholic school who in the state of Hawaii has put more guys in the NFL than I th- they would rival any big high school. They've got twenty five guys in the, through the years in the NFL. Marcus Mariota, Tua Tonga Vailoa are the more more recent ones, but Anyway, so um, we met in high school. I was instantly um, fell in love, and we dated our senior year um, and got married um, actually our sophomore year in college at University of Hawaii. She was going to go away to uh, a mainland school in in Oregon, and luckily her father uh, threw in a new car if she stayed home because he didn't have to deal with out-of-state tuition. Oh, I, I had, wise I, move. Yeah, so he, I, I thanked him for that, because I had already committed to stay home and not go away. Uh, I said no to some big schools that I had offers from, but that decision, my decision to stay home, was was a five-minute conversation with Dad at home. In our conversa- Your dad wanted you to stay in Hawaii, There right? was There was no question. And the way he he communicated that to me, which made a lot of sense was he used my two older brothers who had already gone through the university of Hawaii and how that led to just opportunities in the community, how the local fans never forget the guys that play for the, for university of Hawaii. And it's true. Mm -hmm. So when I go home today, having played in the NFL, they don't want to talk UH football. They don't want to talk NFL. They they want to talk about the days in the early eighties of, of me playing, being a being a a, a UH player, um, which all those guys were just diehard fans. 
it, it's like a mini version of the SEC where these guys would tailgate from as soon as they could get in the parking lot, which would, I think they open up the gates at like one o'clock in the afternoon and kickoff was until seven thirty. Hmm. And so these guys are uh, like tailgating all day going. So it was this a uh, uh, electric atmosphere back then at the uh, well, the Univers- State. well university of Georgia is still the same way. And I mean, I think 90% of the fans in Athens would know more about Herschel Walker's yep. college career, the three years he was there, than the 12 or 15 years that he was playing pro ball. Yep. And it's true. Like, everything revolves around in a in a atmosphere like small town, kind of small state like Hawaii, small town like Athens. Everything revolves around college football. Yep. Yeah, so getting back to Kathy... Um, Athletic standpoint, everything was great. Again, I was a popular guy because of that. But spiritually, um, that that was something that um, was not evident, mainly by my actions and just the way we grew up. We grew up Catholic, but it was like we barely attended. We barely even went. So um, because of that and because my dad was a... He didn't really... um, they didn't, they didn't really supervise us really well, so we were up to no good it, with just, um, for me, it was girls early on uh, in high school. So by the time I met Kathy, I, I guess I, you could say I kind of had a reputation of that, which I'm not proud of, but so, but Kathy was different, and that's what attracted me to her. She was um, very strong and very... Um, she knew exactly, she wouldn't back down, um, and she knew exactly what she wanted. And that, to me, uh, combined with my dad, was the reason why I think I made it. Because there's many times in the process of getting from A to B that I I just wanted to quit, and give up, and go do something else. But she kind of kept me focused and kept me... I could, you should, I I should say, engaged in, in um, what was ahead of me again that I I, I really couldn't see. So she, so we we got married, like I said, in college. We had our child, our first oldest son in college, but it wasn't until our senior year, really at the end of my senior year, um, that we had this uh, God ordained thing happened to the both of us on March the 3rd, 1990. Um, so our marriage was pretty shaky, uh, mainly because of me. I was just an idiot. I was just, you know, uh, selfish and didn't know how to treat her and uh, wanting to just do my own thing. And so I got a phone call from my brother, my older brother's pastor, my older brother, the middle brother that I'm close with. He was a strong uh uh, Christian, um, leading a huge youth Bible study. And anyway, this, this pastor called me, I had in college gotten it really heavily into breeding and showing and raising German shepherd dogs. So this pastor knew that. So he had brought this black lab puppy and he, he called me out of the blue and said, I bought, I got this puppy. I know you raise dogs. I, I need some help. Can you come over and kind of just get me started, like food and how to care for it. And so I spent the day with him. Uh, we went shopping and bought whatever he needed. And then he invited Kathy and I over for dinner at their house. He and his wife had a barbecue. And then we were sitting around in, in their little living room after dinner, just talking uh, about a whole bunch of different stuff, mainly about, you know, the draft, because this was like a month before the draft, the NFL draft. And by that point... So I'd you're already, a senior in I'd already University finished. of Hawaii. And is Kathy the same age? Yes. Well, she's actually no, she's actually a year, about nine months younger than me. So I'd already finished my senior year. I already went to the NFL Combine and did really well there um, to where my, my um, the attention toward me was just going like this, leading up to the draft. Like the 49ers flew me out a week and a half to two weeks before the draft 
they flew eight guys up. I was one of the eight. And they said, you eight are going to be our first three picks. And that was true. And have, but I wasn't one of those three. <laughs> but uh, this, <laughs> all that was all in the media constantly. So the, the pastor knew all that because he watched the news. He read the papers. But he wanted the conversation shifted at, a, at some point to how is um, our marriage and how is... Um, it was mainly about our marriage, and through that, I think he was able to kind of figure out that we had no Jesus in the middle of it. And so at about 9, 30, 10 o'clock at night, he systematically kind of walked us through the, hmm. the salvation message, what it means, and clearly laid it out. Come on, that's it great. Clearly laid it out just um, to, to by, by the end of, end of all that, Kathy and I looked at each other and we said, wow, we were just blown away. And this, this is what we, exactly what we're missing. In his home in Hawaii um, at about 11 p.m. at night by that point, um, he led us through a, a, a prayer to where we confess with our mouth Jesus as Lord and truly believe that in our heart, as Romans 10 says, and um, gave him our future put it in his hands because mm. we were making a mess of it and how that um, led to so that was just amazing it was a, a special amazing time and then for the weeks following leading up to the draft I literally almost met with him daily this pastor who I still stay in contact with till today um, just to give me a foundation of the Bible like in parts like the first five books and just different parts of the Bible. So I, knowing that if I do get drafted and I, if I get drafted, like they're saying, which is going to be pretty high, that I'll probably be gone right away. And so he didn't want me leaving without that. So I committed to him to meet with him. Sure enough, the draft comes. Draft day was at her house, her parents' house on Oahu. My, pretty much my whole family, which is a big family, and her family all in this big, huge family room. And um, we're watching the first round. I wasn't expected to go first, but there were a lot of teams that were talking to my agent saying that I could very well be uh, anywhere from an early second. But I was definitely going to be a first day guy. Uh, and they were looking more, more in the second round, which is what ended up happening. Uh, so right as the telecast, the telecast went out on pick 58, uh, ESPN went out, uh, they closed up the coverage and my phone rang <laughs> literally as the, as the TV coverage was going down cause they had 60 picks. Mm. Um, and I was the number 60th pick. And so the phone rang, um, it was the chargers. They basically said, uh, how would you like to be a charger? I said, I would love to be a charger and <laughs> the, the room exploded. And they had already picked me. Literally, I was on a plane that night. They flew me out. Uh, we had a little, quick little party at, the, at my dad's, at our home that we grew up in. And then I was off to the airport. I had to get on a plane and do a bunch of media stuff back in San Diego. Like, everything, my whole life just changed, like, overnight. I'm glad I had that time with Pastor Dave Elian back in, back in Hawaii to kind of just ground me in, in that because... I didn't know what was about to happen in the months to come, but I really needed that. So I leave. We go. I go have a mini camp that same week, or, or like a rookie mini camp, uh, which I do well in. Then we have an, a full blown mini camp with the veterans, do really well there. We think we had three mini camps leading up to training camp. I did well in all of them to the extent where they named me going into training camp as their starter at left tackle. Wow, basically, that's amazing. Basically said that's my job to lose. That was in the in the, in the press in the in the papers. I was obviously pretty stoked about that. Um, so first day of training camp, I'm uh, so you know all those mini camps are in in, in shorts, <laughs> right? Which mean nothing, right? In football, other than you're quick and you're fast and you're athletic, but that's a, that's all you really get. You don't get the other stuff that involve uh, go mm. with you know linemen and so first day of camp i 
I uh, leave the locker room. There's all the media. They want to talk. So I talk to them and go down to the field where everyone is uh, practice is about to get started. We, we get warmed up, split up into individual groups. And then about 40 minutes into it, they blow the, the horn, meaning that we're going to, uh, the first time the offense, number one offense, it's number number def, number one defense are gonna go at each other. Mm-hmm. It's a running drill. All the plays are running. There's no passing in this drill. It's called nine on seven. So there's nine there's um, nine defensive guys against seven offensive guys. Every team does it. College, high school, pros. It's the same. Uh, run a play. I think it was either the second or the third play of this first drill in full pads as a charger starting left tackle i'm at the left tackle position this is like a it's a very common play where the guard and the tackle on the opposite end are going to pull down the line all the other linemen are going to be blocking back and this the guard is going to kick out the defensive end on the far side and the tackle is going to lead up the hole and the running back is literally right behind that guy that's me so i'm i'm leading up Leaning up the hole, I ain't my guy, and the linebacker tries to shoot underneath me. I plant in a split second to try to get my hands on him, and my um, I feel a tear in my foot, like a pop, tear, something break. It just, I actually hurt it. So I immediately go to the ground, and um, trainers come and... To my aid to see what's going on they moved the drill down like 10 more yards and kept practice going while i'm being looked at by the trainers and uh they i couldn't move my foot at all it felt like something was broken and i couldn't put any weight on it so they cart me off put me on a big flatbed cart and cart me off to the locker room to where i'm all by myself they pack it with ice put it on a pad shut the lights off in the training room and said, we'll see you when practice is done. And I'm there in this training room all by myself. And um, just uh, all kind of emotions running through my body, in, in, through my mind, like anger, frustration, uh, disappointment. Why God? Why is of this? Course. Why, yeah. why, why yeah. this? So they take, a, take an x-ray right after practice where you, you, they could clearly see that something was definitely wrong. <laughs> that, so what it was is it's called the posterior tibula tendon that runs down the inside of your thigh, goes on your calf. It attaches to your arch on the inside of your arch of your foot. And it, it kind of is really important with the movement of your toes with, without that, that. That had detached from the bone. It ripped right off the bone. Mm. So they immediately... Uh, said, well, there's, they, they already knew that I, or thought that I wasn't going to be able to play that year, but they were already looking for a replacement uh, guy for me. Um, and um, they, they needed to do an MRI to rule out because they, they thought maybe even the tendon might have been uh, uh, compromised. And if that was the case, I was totally done. Wouldn't be able to play on it. I was on the... the, the Injury roller coaster ride, emotional roller coaster ride for a day and a half, where none of my teammates, none of my coaches could even engage with me. It was like I was a walking dead man. <laughs> yeah. They, they, and you don't even know these people well. I mean, you just got there. Not, right? not really that it. well. I mean, I know some, the linemen pretty well, but it was just such a, there was so much hype built up about me that was going to be this, this young t- guy to come in at left tackle. To now I'm, now I'm done. <laughs> so it was so the, you're thinking about your career being over. That's what they were saying. Whoa. And so the thoughts running through my head at that point were, were pretty intense. Um, so the following days is when the MRI was scheduled. So they gave me a golf cart to get around on. I was immobilized in a walking boot with crutches. Um, I'm watching the afternoon practice. It's about... 2.30, 3 o'clock in the afternoon in San Diego. I was just really discouraged, just like, this sucks. And I, I 
I got in my, well, I was already in the cart watching practice. I just drove my cart back to my dorm room. I uh, wanted to call Kathy and see what she was doing. I just didn't even want to watch football. I was just so messed up inside emotionally. Kathy was there at the practice. She saw the whole thing happen. She was there with some other friends. Uh, she had instantly called back home uh, on a rotary phone because we didn't even have cell phones yet. Mm-hmm. saying, hey, something's really bad has happened to Leo. I don't know what it is, but they ask, they, they carted him off the field that we need to start praying for, for him. So got a whole bunch of people back home praying for me. So that, that next day when I leave to go back to the, um, to the dorm room, I call her from the rotary phone in my dorm room, and she she's like super upbeat. She's like, actually happy and she's sharing all this stuff that the lord has been showing her she's just she was immersing herself in the word with miracles Mm. and with faith um anything to do with faith or miracles she was she was reading it and she was Mm. proclaiming it and so she wanted to share some of that with me Mm -hmm. and so i in the dorm room I'm, i'm sitting on a couch it's not a fancy dorm room, pretty basic. I'm laying down. She starts reading some scriptures. Then she gets to um, Ephesians chapter 6, uh, starting in verse 10 through 17, where it talks about the armor, yep. the armor of God. But pre- before that, how it's not a battle of flesh and blood, but of principalities and powers mm-hmm. in the heavenly places. And so she's reading it to me. I'm, I'm laying prone on, on, the, on, on the couch. And I, I literally feel in my left leg, which is was the injured leg, uh, I feel like, you know how when your foot loses circulation and it goes numb and then the circulation comes back and right. you get that tingly feeling? Yep. That's the feeling I felt as she's reading Ephesians 6 to me. I was like, what is, what? And I'm just closing my eyes, listening to her voice. I had to read it a second time. She got all the way to, to the end. She read, I said, can you read it again? By that time, I was buckling off my, the buckles of the brace, the, of the big boot. I felt prompting to try and move my foot. I could move my foot forward, backwards, turn it around with zero pain. And I just stopped weeping, bawling. My goodness. And, and, and Kathy's like worried, like, are you okay? I explained to her what what, uh, what, what was going on, what was happening. God literally on the spot put that tendon back together. That night, so that when I shared it with her, yeah, it was, it was a great time of just rejoicing and thanksgiving. And, but I had still had this MRI scheduled at like 7 o'clock. This trainer picks me up, takes me down to the place where the, they're, they're going to do the image. And... For the whole time I'm in that little tube, the MRI tube, the enemy is taunting me, you know, crazy stuff like God didn't heal your foot. You're going to you're going back to Hawaii and be uh, working the sugar cane. <laughs> it's, just, it's just crazy. <laughs> yeah. Thoughts. Yeah. You're going to be a security guard or whatever. Right. And uh, so I am being a kind of a fairly new baby in Christ. I uh, didn't know a whole lot of scripture by memory, but I knew a couple and the two that jumped out to me during that time in the tube was greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's good. So for 55 minutes or so, I'm literally audibly saying that pretty loud. And they have mm-hmm. a microphone. In it. So, the, the so tech, you were kind of, you were speaking out. Over scripture. myself. Yeah. For 55 minutes, I'm doing it. The trainer, um, when I'm done, the trainer's waiting for me. He takes me back to the, to the school college where we, where we were at and I sleep soundly wake up the next morning go to the training room and the trainer sees me coming in and he like weighs me in like like get over here I go back there I, I put the boot back on but I didn't really need it I put the boot back on and I'm, I'm going in there and he goes and he's from Hawaii. He's a local guy. So he has a little local kind of, we had that li- little local way of talking to each other. He goes, brother, I don't know what happened, but 
the MRI is absolutely clean. They can't say anything wrong with your tendon. Everything is fine. Man. And, and wow. Yeah. So looking back, and Captain, I often talk about it. And every time I share it, I believe that God allowed that that whole thing to play out and to happen as a kind of like a memorial stone for us where he had the Israelites go back into the where they crossed mm-hmm. and, and get these stones to remember. Yep. I think that that was meant for us to walk through that really dark period. God was going to heal me of it and that we would always be able to, that would, that was like a stake in the ground in our faith Yeah, and that we could always go back to and remember when, and we still do till today. Hmm. And we have through, throughout the years. I, um, ended up playing my whole rookie year. Um, and God's sense of humor allowed me to be a consensus all-rookie. It made every single one of the all-rookie teams play the left tackle, played against some really talented, good players my first mm-hmm. year out of the gate. That was all within... See, I got I got saved in, um, in March, and this was now September mm. of, of the same year. All that had happened, I got injured, got healed, and then ended up playing, um, playing the, whole, the whole year out at left tackle, and it was on my way. Did you ever have an injury in that foot again? Did not. My goodness. It was, you, no problems. You would say it was completely supernaturally healed. Zero problems ever with that with that foot. So what did that do to your, you and Kathy's faith and trust in God as you moved it's into the NFL? It's like being shot out of a canyon, man. It, it would just skyrocketed our faith. I don't put any limitations on on what God what God wants to do. And obviously we leave, leave as the, as to the timing to him, because hmm. maybe he needs to work things out in, yeah. in individuals yeah. and, and it just, he's waiting for certain things to happen. But as far as him being able to, to do the supernatural, no one can tell me otherwise, because I lived through it myself. So Leo, what would you say after that would be, I mean, that's a pretty big highlight. That yep. right there. Uh, is there anything else that you would say as you walked out your career as a Christian NFL player that stands out spiritually? Um, I think it was just all the many guys and gals, the couples that we um, met over the years. We were all in from day one. And uh, like, for instance, my rookie year, God knowing that I needed someone in the locker room to hold me accountable, a teammate that is walking the same thing. I he he partnered me up with this. I think at that point he was probably in his eleventh year, veteran, but he was mm-hmm. a cornerback, small little, small little guy, but knew the word. He was just so grounded in the Bible, in the word, and he really challenged me with um, script scripture memorization. And so we had this. So we became really, really close. He and I. Name is Gilbert. He's still alive. He's he's in the Chargers Hall of Fame. But just certain ones that God has brought up across our path, those are the, those are the special memories that I have from that point of view in the NFL. Is uh, is walking out because the NFL in itself is is so phony. It's so superficial. It's so shallow. It's you know you see people showing up to games. We still laugh. Kathy and I still laugh about this. I mean, they're wearing like these ridiculous like mink coat, um, mink coats to a football earrings. game. Earrings, uh, the, it's the, just, the it's, diamond earrings. It's the it's the posing capital of the epitome of it. It's like who's got the nicest cars, who's got this and that. Kathy would show up in in a sweatsuit. <laughs> she refused. <laughs> she refused to succumb to that type of stuff. Yeah. And um, she would bring all our kids to every game, home game, away games. They just stayed home because it, it was just too much involved with travel and all that. So I'm just glad that we had all that happen to us early that we never had to deal with a lot of the traps that so many deal with, mm-hmm. especially after they're done playing that yeah. 
the, the divorce rate in the NFL is astronomical. I think it's like in the high 80s or 90%, like after you're done playing. Hmm. It's pretty dismal. So did you guys like have Bible studies and things like that? So we did. We did usually hosted, help keep you strong? We, we, we always had a core group on every team. And for the most part, we always, aside from one or two years, we hosted it at our house where we'd have, you know, a dozen or so guys with their spouses come over and we would just have some amazing, amazing times, man. Break bread. So usually every team has a chaplain. So the chaplain usually would facilitate that. We had a great one in, in the Rams in L.A. He was really involved. We became really close friends with with that guy his name was Chuck, Chuck Obrimsky so but with every team the chaplain would um would kind of facilitate that for the believers so he would do the service on Sunday before the game but he also do the just the weekly stuff just the needs of 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 people on the team he was always there in the locker room and they would always have a night usually it would usually be on Monday nights because um Tuesday's a day off. We'd either be on Monday or Tuesday. Would would be a, a full blown Bible study for, for our group. So how many guys, you know, you played on three teams. What would you say kind of if if you could estimate how many guys are really solid, fired up for the Lord on any given NFL team, in your opinion? I would say there's a probably usually a minimum of ten. I'm talking really solid guys hmm. who um because there's not that many on the, on the team. Yeah. So, so that's I I mean, you know, college is huge, but pros is they really narrow it down. How many guys on a team? So now it's 53 active, but then you have the practice squad guys. We would include them too, uh, um, in, in in Bible studies and such. But mm-hmm. active players uh, now are 53. When I played, it was 50. It was a little more. I think it was like 57. Closer to 60, but they've narrowed it down since uh, over the years to 53. Mm. So, Leo, changing the subject a little bit, what um, what would be a highlight of your NFL career? Like, is there something that stands out as amazing and a special memory for you? By far, it would probably be my first, my rookie year when my dad first got to see me play. That's in, great. In oh, that's, I was going to ask you about that. So yeah. I was starting. We were playing the Raiders at home in San Diego. They were announcing the offense. I got announced out. Uh, I knew they, where they were sitting. And me, me and my dad over the years, all my brothers kind of did it, but and I kind of followed suit, is we would always kind of know where he was sitting in the stadium. Nice. And we, and we would always, I even did it, I did it all throughout college, and I even Find myself doing it. I'm, I'm a professional player now. It's it's getting this from him. That sign of yes. <laughs> that's that was that's it. Steve. Great. It was just this. Yeah. But this. Yeah. This communicated so much. Yeah. And so here I am. We're playing against the Raiders. I had a great game. We won the game. I bring my mom and dad on the field. We take this pictures that all the family has. We have it. Back at our house, my, all my brothers have it. Me and mom and dad, our first game. To me, and it wasn't really the game itself, it's what happened after the game. So we just were about to close on our first home. We're, we bought a home in Rancho Bernardo, which is a, was at that time a pretty new community. Um, it's a bustling community now. Um, but it was our first home. We had out of the gate. We 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 rented an apartment near the stadium because we just wanted to figure things out and not make a rash decision right away. So we didn't buy a big home. We just rented a apartment so we had time to kind of sort things out. But uh, we ended up doing that right before the end of the season. We had this time where well, we were actually showing them the house. The house was being finished. They're putting in carpet and just the finishing touches on the home and. Um, it was on a Monday. The game was on Sunday. And usually in, you, you have to go back to the stadium on Monday for a, a film review and a short little workout. So we had a like a brunch. We showed them the house. And then I'm looking at my watch. So oh, I got to get going already because I had to, I had to drive in to, back to the stadium, which is like a half an hour drive. So I kissed my mom, Kathy, goodbye. My dad overheard that. 
And so I, I opened the garage door and there he is. He's like waiting for me. And he just broke down. How oh, proud and what just the whole, it was, he verified that, yeah, this was definitely his dream for himself. He basically said, you made all my dreams come true. Wow. Just, just watching, Your dad, be, being great. there and watching everything in real life. He was now back going back in his mind when I was a little guy and kind of rehashing that with me. Yeah. And so we both kind of lost it. I gave him a hug. I kind of wish now that I, I kind of cherished it, but I was really pushing up against the clock that I needed to leave. But just having that time with him was super special. <laughs> Yeah. Super, super special. And then how many more games did he get to see before he died? So I think uh, just a couple. Yeah, because he, he died going into my second year. Yeah. So he got to he see. He was young, me. wasn't he? He was 62. Wow. So and even that, um, that's a pretty cool, not a cool story, but it's a good one to, to mention in that. So we just had our second child, our daughter, Allie who's now 31. Um, so this is, she's born on July 1st. Training camp was starting in a couple of weeks. We just bought her home from the hospital, bringing an infant home. You know, I wasn't, she was, I was still in full-blown working out mode. Kathy calls my sister back home to get addresses to mail out baby announcements to the family and different ones. And then my dad happens to be right around there, hears them talking says, I want to talk to Leo when you're done. And I, and I could hear Kathy say, oh, I, I think he's around here. Let me go look where he's at. And I knew what that meant, that he wanted, that dad wanted to talk to me. And I was like, this was like late at night already. And I was tired. I was beat tired. I wanted to go to bed. And I told Kathy, tell him I'll call him tomorrow morning. And he goes, no, no, hold on. He's right here. And she gives me the phone. <laughs> we end up talking. Way to go, for, Kathy. We end up talking for like an hour and a half hour and a half that was long man it was all about football what was going on with the holdouts and camp and all this stuff and as we're wrapping up the conversation he tells me how proud he was again and that he's gonna call me in a few days when I actually do report before I report to camp and that the whole family is uh is praying for me and then the last thing he says is um to take care of that little girl meaning our daughter that we just bought home from the hospital they hang up. I'm fast asleep. Get off. My phone is ringing. It's like 2.30, 3 o'clock in the morning. I pick it up. It's my brother. His voice is all kind of, I can barely make out what he's saying because he's his voice is all kind of choked up. And he basically breaks the news that dad passed away right at home in a, with, from a massive heart attack. Just dropped. Like literally four hours after I had that conversation with him, four or five hours, he was wow. gone. So that's so cool. You had like a whole hour and a half yeah. just to talk and chat and be just yourself, a normal conversation with dad. Yeah, yeah. And and it was your last one. The last one is the last one. So that whole process was pretty, um, pretty stressful. I I had to come home. Well, Kathy and I flew home. Luckily, our my in-laws were already in San Diego, so they stayed with the young ones. While Kathy and I just hopped on a plane the next morning, flew home, stayed home, had to plan out the services and all that. Training camp had started, worked it out with the team. They knew what was going on. They were fine. Just said, take whatever time you need. So I ended up missing the first couple, two days of camp and um, had the services, flew right back that night. And I was right in the grind, man, like instantly. Didn't have any time to grieve or nothing. Just like, got to go earn my job again. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it was kind of cool in that every night, pretty much I was having dreams of, of my childhood with my dad in it. For man. like, during that whole, like for, for a couple of weeks, I would have yeah. these dreams, like yeah. vivid dreams. Yeah. But one in particular was... Um, it shook me up so much that I was like, wow, what was that all about? Um, it was uh, basically when I went back to the Lord with it um, to kind of piece it together, he was showing me that all my life, since I started playing, since I was 12 years old, 
I played for the sole purpose to honor my earthly dad. Hmm. And that yeah. that broke his heart. Yeah. And I needed to repent of that. And I did on the spot. Wow. And from that point, when I did that, to where every time I stepped on the field from that point forward, everything was different. I played it. I would, I would venture to say I played my best football then. My goodness. Is, is when I was playing for the one and only. Wow. So you not only don't have any kind of a father wound, it's the you complete, have, you have it's like the, It's a, the complete a, opposite a, of a father yeah, wound. You, it's a father idolship. Yeah, that's what it yeah, was. That I needed, like worship the, I needed to dad. repent of that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Wow. Well, you know, that's just so rare. It is. It's rare, man, that you had a dad that was that involved, cared that much. And it was actually that verbal about it. Yeah. You know, I hear these stories all the time from men. That, that's what we do around here is with men's ministry. And, yeah. and they say things like, well, I know my dad loved me, but. Yeah. Um, or I know my dad cared about me, but. And so there's there's very little interaction right. between sons or even daughters and their dads because men are just not as good verbally and yeah. we're just not as emotional. Yeah. And I, I mean, my dad, I have a great relationship with my dad, um, but it, it wouldn't even be on that part either. Like you're talking about. So what a great blessing for you, Leah. Yeah. It was truly a blessing to, um, to at least have that rev- revelation of, because the last thing, I, I didn't even realize it, but when through these dreams I was having, that that's what was coming forth. That was the end result of it. I wonder if that was a little of a, uh, of a catharsis, a grieving, a, it, in it, a positive way. It most likely like, you was. Know, some people have dreams and they have memories that are just totally etched upon their heart that are super negative. Right. Um, Mine was the complete opposite. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's so awesome. How long were your parents married? They were married, I think they were already in their closing in on 40 years or close to it. By the so time. they married young, really young. Yeah. 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 So what's your background as far as, um, your, uh, ethnicity? So both sides, I have Portuguese. Okay. So from mom and dad. So mom was half Portuguese, half Hawaiian. Her mom was pure Hawaiian. And then my dad's side is half Portuguese. Um, and the other half is, um, European, like okay. English. Now, was he big? Was he a big guy? Wide. How tall? He was probably six, six foot. Okay. So that's the thing, right? Because all the boys, if you were to stack us all up from the oldest to me, it was like this. So that's why dad wanted, like, he wanted a couple more. He was projected out saying I could have. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why I wanted yep, 10 kids. He just seen he him getting, getting if, bigger and bigger. He just figured if that eighth one... That Leo doesn't yeah. make it. I need two more to get a shot in the NFL. Yep. That's a cool story. Well, bless bless you, Leo. I mean, this is this is really good. I I didn't know I didn't know the last part, you know, about um, and you told me about the phone call. I do know about that, but I didn't know the dreams and the stuff that happened later. Yeah. God is good. Um, you 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 finished out your whole career as a believer i mean you never wavered you can you, you actually got more fired up it seems like as the years went by yeah. and you told me even about some of the which we don't have time to go into now but just some of the disappointments with some of the people who called themselves christians yeah. and kind of tried, took advantage try to take advantage of you but you didn't seem to let that scar you or build up any bitterness you were still going to follow christ well, that's the thing. That's the big takeaway for everyone is what I would want them to get is, is that, and that, um, he allows us, God allows us to go through things. I think a lot of times for our growth, because that's where we truly, it's like in the NFL or in any sports, you have walkthroughs, right? You go through the, you go through and the, the true test is in the game, but it's all the preparation leading up to that. I think God allows us to go through a similar type of thing where he, he shows us things, then he'll have us go through it. Sometimes it's very difficult, but it's it's to get us um, to another place in in faith, that's, that's or so in understanding, good. and um, so he's good. done that so many times with us. Yeah, yeah. That you don't really understand it all, but when you get on the other side of it, 
it all seems to make sense why you have to go yeah. through what you went through. That's right. Well, men and women, you that are listening to this or watching this, there's really not any difference in your job and what you do than what Leo has done or I do. Some people get more notoriety for it, but the reality is, is that um, being a witness for Christ, continuing to walk with Him is really the answer and the solution for everything. And we're going to go through disappointments. We're going to get injured. We might get injured emotionally. We might get injured spiritually. We might get injured mentally. And I want to just challenge you guys from Leah's story that you hang in there, don't quit. You're going to get knocked down. You're going to get faked out. You're going to go. And some of you carry scars from your past. And I think, Leo, you would say that everybody has something, right? Absolutely. And then you've got to just kind of put the uniform back on every day That's right. and go back out on the field in the arena. Exactly right. So, um, yeah, so I have I've had nine surgeries. Hello. In, in my playing career, a uh, bunch of knees. You, you kind of go through that whole process of dealing with that and then strengthening yourself to get back to a level to where you can compete. And it's, it's something that um, I've had to do nine different times. Why so many? I don't know, but, but uh, what came out of it is just a resilience. Yeah. A resilience of, okay, um, this is a problem, but I can get through it, and God is going to uh, be with me through it. And through that, I think, just became incremental pieces of added strength given to me mm -hmm. or capacity that um, I probably wouldn't have had if I hadn't gone through it. Yeah. Everything was just peachy, yeah. peachy, rosy. Keen. Yeah. yeah, that's so good. That's so good. Well, thanks, Leo. Yep, my I just, um, I, I feel like I could just talk to you for another couple hours, but thanks for giving your time to this and thanks for being a friend, a bloodstained ally uh, for me and for my family. And uh, thanks for, I mean, I, for all of you out there, um, if you can imagine going whitewater rafting with one of the people in the boat being around 300 um, you can realize that we, we were a little low in the water, uh, but it was still a lot of fun. We had it a was blast. a blast. It was a <laughs> yeah. blast. All right, bro. Thanks. All right. Thank you. God bless Thank you guys. You. Thanks for the next podcast. Come check it out. Um, we were, we're constantly putting out new stuff and, uh, great to have you watching it. And thank you, Leah. Thank you. Thank you.